Dr. Ryan Baker is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and is the director of the Penn Center of Learning Analytics. He researches student engagement and robust learning in online and blended settings to better understand how different indicators predict how well students learn. As part of his extensive work in academia, he's to help develop predictive analytics models that have benefited over a million students. So here to talk about his experience and his work, please welcome Dr. Ryan Baker. Thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, for coming today. Thanks for sharing your Saturday morning. I, um, I regret that I couldn't be there in person today. I'm in Wisconsin, um, <clears throat> but I hope that you will enjoy this talk and find it interesting. Um, today, can everyone, can folks see my screen? Oops. Yeah. Okay, great. I heard a yeah. Um, so I heard uh, this talk described as uh, learning engineering. And, and um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about a specific problem in learning engineering that I think is, you know, particularly important in this day and age. And one that maybe some of the folks in this room will help us solve, because if we don't solve it, uh, the potentials of learning technologies won't uh, won't be fully met. Um, so the talk I'll be giving today is entitled Algorithmic Bias in Education. And it's in collaboration with Aaron Hahn, who was a doctoral student of mine and is now uh, the director of impact at a, um, at a charter school network. So who am I? Let me first start by introducing myself. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I was the uh, first president of the International Educational Data Mining Society. So I've been <clears throat> in this area since the beginnings, um, educational data mining being kind of one of the areas of learning engineering. Um, I was one of the associates of the Journal of Educational Data Mining. I've also in more recent years founded a journal called Computer-Based Learning in Context, which tries to study how computer-based learning varies uh, for learners in different kinds of contexts, whether it be un you know schools uh, with, under-resourced schools with fully with historically underrepresented students or schools in developing countries, which a lot of the work in learning engineering has been very US and Europe focused. Um, this journal is about work in that's not for upper middle class students in wealthy industrialized countries. <clears throat> I direct the Penn Center for Learning Analytics, where we both conduct research on these topics and support the university in trying to use learning analytics and learning engineering. I've taught a MOOC, Big Data and Education on edX for the last nine years, and uh, it's free. It's one of the very few MOOCs left that's fully free, so I would invite anybody here to come take it. And finally, we've got a master's in learning analytics starting next fall at Penn, and I'll be directing that. So I keep busy. Um, I didn't put that here, but I also, I, I know we have time to answer questions at the end and discuss, but I'm happy to be interrupted. Please interrupt me if you've got a question or a concern. So in recent years, we, and I mean we kind of as a society, are instrumenting more and more of learners' experiences, all the way from kindergarten to corporate training. And we're instrumenting up learning management systems like Canvas at the undergraduate level or Google Classroom more in K-12, where we see kind of students' interaction with assignments and resources. We're instrumenting up adaptive learning systems where students, you know, might, um, might be a system where they do their homework and they get hints and feedback and scaffolding, or it might be a game, an intelligent game that gives, uh, that, you know, adapts as the learner is playing it. Uh, school information systems, um, the data on student outcomes and course taking, all these are getting more and more instrumented. And so we're collecting data as a field and we're using it, developing algorithms using what's sometimes called machine learning or educational data mining or learning analytics or <clears throat> sometimes even just artificial intelligence, it's called, that can make predictions and inferences about what's going on with the student. So is the student bored? Are they frustrated? Are they uh, confused? Are they trying to get through with minimal effort? Are they um, really, you know, uh, trying to figure out what's going on? Um, and then we can, um, you know, do this to make predictions about whether a student's going to master what they're currently working on or whether they're going to pass the class. And we can use these inferences to benefit students and support instructors. You know, for example, telling an instructor, here are the three students in your class that are most at risk of failing your class, and here's why. There's a lot of applications of these methods, predicting dropout and success and failure, 
Um, automated detection of things like whether a student's learning and whether they're engaged, what their emotion is, what strategies they're using to better individualize to them. As I mentioned, better reports for not just instructors, but also academic advisors, guidance counselors, and other stakeholders, and just to support basic scientific discovery and education. But one of the big problems that we've discovered as a field, and what I'll be talking about today, is that the algorithms that underpin these technologies are often biased against historically underrepresented learners, uh, functioning less accurately for them, and often making systematic errors not present for learners in historically overrepresented groups. Now, it's not like there are people in like Silicon Valley who are twirling their mustaches and you know evilly and saying, I'm going to make algorithms that, that reinforce biases. But because of errors in the way that we often build them, we're creating these biases. And this is far from unique to education, right? Um, you know, uh, Garcia wrote a really great paper on algorithmic bias, foundational paper about six years ago, <clears throat> about how, for example, a, um, a hospital a medical school in its admissions um, was taking the, the bias decisions already made during admissions and replicating them. The algorithm was figuring out how to be biased just like the humans. And so when we've got bias in our data, we get bias in our algorithms. Um, Garcia also reported about how often people uh, who are minorities who applied for credit cards got worse deals out of their credit cards. More recently, there was a, a case where it was shown that an online test prep company was offering test prep more expensively in districts, uh, in um, zip codes with more Asian Americans. Um, so there are these biases kind of pop up in these systems all the time when we're not looking for them. Um, another example um, in, uh, in, in criminal sentencing was that um, a, a county in Florida that used an algorithm to figure out whether somebody should be given bail and how much bail to give them systematically, <clears throat> systematically identified that black people were at higher risk of reoffending than white people. And that was partly true because judges were giving more harsh sentences for the exact same offense to different people. The algorithm was replicating again the bias of the judges. So algorithmic bias, these are some examples. An algorithmic bias is when a biased computer system systematically and unfairly discriminates against individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. And Aaron Hahn and I, in our review that I'll be talking about here, used a working definition where a model is just significantly more accurate <clears throat> or less accurate for different mutually exclusive groups separated by non-malleable factors. So the idea being that um, you, you can't change your race. And if an algorithm is biased on the behalf of race, then that's a problem, that's algorithmic bias. So where does algorithmic bias come from? Well, where do algorithms come from in general? Um, folks talk about the machine learning life cycle of the development of algorithms, which is where you have the actual world. This is what we wanna change. We come up with some task. This is the thing we wanna predict that we're gonna to use to make change. <clears throat> we conduct some kind of measurement or collect data about that task. We develop a model that is going to make a prediction about the task. And then we deploy the model, which changes the world. So let's say we're going to predict, we've got a world where there's a lot of people dropping out of high school. We predict who's going to drop out of high school. We do that by collecting school data. We build a model that predicts who's going to drop out of high school. And then we take that model and we give it to school leaders and teachers and say, this kid is likely to drop out of high school because they're failing their classes. This other kid's likely to drop out of high school because they're getting into a lot of fights. That actually changes the world, and so we have to keep building the model. So that's the machine learning life cycle. And algorithmic bias tends to crop up particularly in two places. First of all, when we learn the models themselves. So uh, when, we, when we develop an algorithm, sometimes because of various reasons, which I'll talk about in a minute, the algorithm is biased. So that's a place where it can pop up. The other big place is in measurement and data. When the data we have or our measurement is not is biased in ways that lead the algorithm to be biased, no matter how good the algorithm is. So these are the two key places where algorithmic bias crops up. It's not that bias doesn't crop up in other places, like people can be biased in how they take action, but that's kind of the fault of humans more directly. So in bias from measurement and data collection, uh, one kind of bias is representational bias, which is when our data is more of some learners than others. 
So for example, y'all are in New York City right now. Let's say that a model is mostly developed using data from suburban middle-class learners, you know, folks in Westchester County, folks on Long Island. And then the model is used in Jackson Heights, the most diverse uh, part of the entire country. In that case, the model might not work that well on the learners from Jackson Heights. And this happens because oftentimes suburban and middle-class districts are more welcoming to developers and researchers than urban districts <clears throat> for various reasons, which are kind of out of scope for now. But because of that, people collect data sets on convenience populations. They use them more broadly. They don't work. And sometimes people will say, well, I use the complete data set. You know, I, um, I got every, I'm at a university and I take the data on everybody in my university and, um, and use that in my model. So it can't be biased because it's the full data set. But if a group is rarely seen in the data set, you can still get bias. Henry Anderson at the University of Texas Arlington showed, for example, that the model that they were using at their university couldn't make effective prediction on Native American learners because there just weren't enough Native American learners at the University of Texas at Arlington. That's a case where it's not like it's you know the fault of the developers, but it's just not possible right at the start to make a model that's going to be fair. <clears throat> Another kind of bias is called measurement bias, and that's a bias in the training examples used to develop models. So we, we develop these models based on giving them cases of the different things we want to look at. Um, so take, for example, that example about prison sentencing earlier. If the judges are biased and we build models to do what the judges do, we'll be biased. Um, another example is that sometimes in developing models using learn for learning engineering of students' emotions, sometimes people will make the mistake of having people do the coding of emotions to say, this kid is bored, this kid's frustrated, who aren't from the same cultural background as the learners they're coding. And um, I showed in co collaboration with some colleagues at Intel a few years ago, for example, that if you took st students from Turkey, the nation of Turkey, and you had coders from the United States, those coders tend to be systematically wrong and would systematically misinterpret um, the students. Now, even if you ask people to give judgments about themselves, you can still get bias because people can be biased about themselves. Um, people can make errors and systematic errors about their own, um, their own thinking. So it's not even just a solution to do that. Bias creeps up all over the place. So if we know these kind of biases happen and we're trying to engineer an algorithm for some learning task, we, ha we have a process we have to follow in making sure that algorithm is not biased. The first stage of that process is unknown bias. We don't know who the algorithm is unfair for. We can move from there by, by researching it to known bias, knowing our algorithms are broken, which is a lot better than unknown bias. Hopefully from there, we can move to fairness, you know, make, fixing the problems, and finally to equity. Um, now it's my contention that right now there's a lot of work on fairness and equity, but not much work on going from unknown bias to known bias. And that's actually a problem because you can't fix a problem until you know it's there. It's really hard. And so one of the big things that we need to do as a community of scholars and as researchers and developers is to fix this problem. And many of you may have the opportunity, I bring this up to y'all in large part because many of you, as you go out into solving these problems, make sure you know what the problem is before you solve it. So what do we know about bias impacting learners in common demographic categories? Ken Holstein at Carnegie Mellon noted that industrial developers often don't know and Luke Paquette at Illinois noted that most research in this field doesn't even mention learner demographics, much less research it. Educational data mining, the majority of papers don't even say who their learners are. They just treat the learners like the learners, like all learners are magically the same, which is a really big problem in my opinion. So I'm going to give a brief summary on our on our the findings of our review of the literature. We Aaron and I sat down and like looked at every paper we could find on this and really like spent months and months on this. Um, and for full details about a year ago, you can see our paper on my webpage. But for the most up to date, there's only one article I know about that's not in there yet. Um, a grad student, San Lee, helped us to kind of is helping us to kind of keep it updated. And then we're like, we've got this new wiki page where we're kind of trying to keep it up to date as much as possible. So the community knows what we know about bias in ed tech. So several papers show that educational prediction algorithms perform worse for African-American students and Latino students, Latinx students, than other learners, including algorithms that predict grades, predict whether a student will fail a course, predict whether they'll graduate and whether they'll drop out. It's a really big problem. However, not every technology is equally affected by this. 
Automated essay scoring and self-regulated learning detection have been found to be largely unbiased. Uh, so this is, again, even in cases where there's big societal biases and everybody knows about them, we still have to find out if they apply in a certain situation. Now, some folks uh, like uh, you and Kizilchak have recommended prediction based explicitly on race, like saying, I think you're going to drop out because you're a member of this race. I am not a believer in that. I think that that can make the model, like you, the, you and colleagues have shown that can make models less accurate and it can rep replicate bias in decisions being made by instructors. So if we predict based on race, for example, we actually can replicate instructors' biases. I'll talk about the wolf example in just a minute. Also, there's almost never enough data to test for biases impacting Native American learners, which is a really big problem because there are a lot of Native American learners out there. Just in any given data set, they're often not well enough represented. One big exception, really the only one I know of, is work by the Infinite Campus Platform where they got data from every kid in the state of South Dakota and were actually able to uh, validate that their models were effective for Native American learners. Admirable work. Nationality, there's evidence for bias in terms of nationality. Uh, for example, on a test of foreign language proficiency, one system inaccurately gave Arabic and Hindi speaking students lower scores than human raters did. In another study, um, Ogan and her colleagues looked at models of student help seeking, whether the help in a learning system worked, and what made the help effective for different learners. And they built, they got data in the Philippines, Costa Rica, and the United States, and each of those models were more accurate for learners in their own countries than for other countries. And another model on standardized examination scores found that if you train the model on data from the USA, um, it was more accurate for students that were economically more similar in America than students that were than countries that were less wealthy. Gender. Gender is a really interesting one because there's very complicated results on algorithmic bias for gender in education. <clears throat> sometimes models are biased against female students, and sometimes models are biased against male students. And I think that comes from the fact that um, that these days gender is increasingly complex. The biases that gender has in society. Um, and the, our models are reflecting that. So we always have to check for it. Now, those are the three categories that have been most studied. What about bias impacting learners in other groups? There's just been insufficient research. There needs to be more. And I'm persuaded that we don't even know about all the groups that are being impacted. For example, um, there's been a couple papers showing that our automated essay scoring, forum post uh, diagnosis, more accurate for native speakers than non-native speakers. To my knowledge, there's been absolutely no work on algorithmic bias in education in terms of learner dialect. Many people in this room probably speak non-standard, non-prestige dialects of your uh, of your of the language you speak natively, and to that extent, algorithms might be less effective for you. But no one's looked at it. There has been work to develop learning systems that are appropriate for speakers of non-traditional dialects. Uh, Finkelstein's work using African-American vernacular English and learning systems that, that communicate in that. But there's been no work to check for um, algorithmic bias, even though it's very likely. Disabilities. There's been only a couple studies on um, whether ed tech is biased against learners with disabilities in terms of its algorithms. Both those studies found evidence for algorithmic bias, but there's just been only two studies in very limited contexts. Um, urbanicity. Rural learners actually tend, in a, in, one, in a couple studies of models of emotion, one by Okampa, one by Botello that's not on the slide, Models of student emotion tend to, if they're developed on urban and suburban learners, tend to work, work much less well for rural learners. However, other models haven't seen evidence for this split. Parental educational background sometimes seems to be associated with algorithmic bias. Parental work and mobility. Um, Burn uh, Baker et al. in work with Andy Burning at the Renaissance Institute in Texas found that um, algorithms that were predicting student success um, were less accurate for kids who had a parent in the military. Socioeconomic status, lots of a few studies showing evidence for algorithmic bias there. Now, given that some of these constructs only had like one or two studies for them, and you know, if it hadn't been for the Military uh, Child Educational Consortium funding the work, for example, on uh, kids with a parent in the military, probably never would have been found. There's almost certainly other groups that aren't studied that are being affected by algorithmic bias in education, and we just don't know. So overall, <clears throat> 
Models trained on one group of learners generally perform more poorly for new groups. Not shocking, but we're doing it as a field. There's investigation for of bias for many groups that are still needed. Um, my colleague Bruce McLaren at Carnegie Mellon has just started a project looking at algorithmic bias affecting non-binary and transgender learners. Um, I've, I'm aware of none on religious minorities. Collecting and training on a diverse sample of students can help us have less algorithmic bias, but we still have to check for it. So this is kind of how we can think about going from unknown bias to known bias. How can we go to fairness and equity in ed tech? I think that there are two key categories of obstacles to overcoming bias in our field, in, a, in algorithmic bias. One is the lack of data on group membership. The other is the lack of transparency on bias and group specific outcomes. And I think, for example, lack of data and group membership, how do we get here? A lot of people just don't think it's important. A lot of people have privacy concerns. And this is one of these really interesting challenges because a lot of people have said, let's have no data on student group membership on demographics and identity so we can protect kids' privacy. And protecting kids' privacy is important, but it's also important to make sure that our technologies work for all learners. There's a certain sense to which, um, is it helping a student if we're being absolutely sure that we don't collect any data on their race and the algorithm works 15% less well for them? There's also a lot of issues of regulatory and legal restrictions, which vary by country and even by US state. Lack of transparency and bias in group specific outcomes. What I mean by this is that a lot of uh, folks in industry don't even report what well, they don't look for, and they don't report differences in effectiveness between groups. And that's in part because there's strong commercial incentives against transparency in group data collection. Imagine, if you will, being the only vendor for middle school mathematics to report that your technology has algorithmic biases. Many of them do, but only one vendor, let's say, reports on it. <clears throat> in that case, all the other vendors are going to say, look, these folks are bad. They have algorithmic bias. They're not going to simply even say if they have it themselves. Also, there's a lot of um, monolithic presentation of evidence. So a lot of the, um, there's a lot of repositories out there that say this ed tech works, this ed tech doesn't work. And they all treat it like it either works or it doesn't work. Um, Atlanta School District has had a nice initiative in the last year where they say they're not going to consider evidence from contexts that are totally different than Atlanta. And I think that's really important. At some level, if you're Atlanta, who cares if it works perfectly in suburban New York, right? That doesn't mean it's going to work in Atlanta. But you have to test that things work for the kind of learners that are using them. So how do we go? Where do we go from here? Well, as you go out into working on these problems in industry in the real world, I would encourage you to think about four steps. Improve data collection, I'll talk about each of these in turn. Improve tools and resources, facilitate incentivize openness and broaden the community. So where possible, when you can, collect data on as many dimensions of student identity as you can. Um, also, uh, folks are increasingly trying to understand learners, not just in terms of that outsiders impose on them, but in terms of the categories they use to describe themselves and checking for algorithmic bias in terms of these categories. Um, in, you know, in, in industry and in, um, in the public sector, encourage people to balance the risk of privacy violations of the risk of algorithmic bias. There actually are ways to reduce privacy risk without simply saying, we're not gonna collect the data. <clears throat> you don't need to say, we don't, you know, it certainly does protect privacy to a degree to say we're not going to, to, to even find out what race or sex the student is. But you can also do things like data obfuscation, which is data obfuscation is that you just don't report. You, you hide it if there's only a small number of people. So, for example, if you're in a school that has, um, say, 700 learners that are Latinx, that are Latinx, Saying a student is Latinx is not going to is not going to let somebody know who that student is. But if you had only two Native American learners, you might want to uh, obfuscate that variable. Another thing that we've been doing at the University of Pennsylvania is creating infrastructures so people can analyze data but not actually directly view it. So you can do analysis on full data, but you can't actually see as a human being which learners in which group. And the assistance project has been working on things like legal agreements for access. So the bottom line is there are ways we can collect identity data so we can check for algorithmic bias without making it so that we uh, can't, uh, without violating privacy while still keeping privacy safe. We also need to create practices for making sure our training sets are representative. 
for making sure that we are including learners that are underrepresented. <clears throat> and for those of you who might be interested in going into academia, we need statistical methods for determining how much data is needed to, for these algorithms to work for sub subgroups. We don't even know that yet. Like that is that has not been something the field's paid attention to. My lab has been doing some work in this area. We need more. We need to work to reduce or avoid bias during the labeling process. I mentioned a minute ago our example in Turkey where we showed that American coders should not be coding the emotions of Turkish students. Also, if we say try to predict um, school suspensions, it's a well-known phenomenon that school administrators tend to take the same thing that two students do and if they're of different races, treat them differently. It's a terrible thing that this is true, but since it is, we have to take it into account when we build our models. Don't explicitly train models to be biased. This is one of the craziest things is with all, there are actually vendors out there that explicitly train their models to be biased. Todd Feathers is an investigative journalist who reported on a large national K-12 predictive analytics vendor that provides a model of school that relies almost entirely on race and socioeconomic status to say if a student will drop out. This model that this vendor was giving to school districts, was selling to school districts, was telling school districts basically, this investigative journal thought basically that if the student is black, they will drop out. And if they are not black, they will not drop out. That deserves everybody. It's a terrible thing uh, that, that this one vendor, large vendor is doing this. <coughs> Wolf used race as a predictor in a model predicting course grade at universities. She and her colleagues found that if you took all the grades on all the assignments and all the exams, you could do a pretty good job predicting the final course grade, which is kind of blatantly obvious. But if you put race in, you could do even better. And so again, let's say that we've got two students who get equal grades on all the assignments, equal grades on all the exams, one of them is of race A and the other is of race B. And knowing what race they are predicts what grade they get for the course. Wolf and her colleagues conclude that race should be used to tell instructors which students are at risk of poor grades. I conclude something else that that university has a really big problem that predictive analytics is not going to solve. If you've got instructors who are taking two students who get equal grades on everything and saying that one gets a B and the other gets an A because of their race, you've got a really big racism problem. And incidentally, as of this year, this university has dropped this practice and they no longer use race to predict course grades. I don't know if they're trying to fix the problem, though, that their instructors are racist. That's that's a big problem that I haven't heard them trying to fix. That just makes me upset every time I talk about that example. Um, facilitate incentivize openness. Push people, um, those of you who go into the public sector, push people to make decisions about what curricula are effective based on schools and districts similar, not just overall effectiveness. And um, Digital Promise has been working, Digital Promise is a nonprofit out in California that's been working to take algorithmic bias reviews, which are used in, by government agencies in demonstrating the effectiveness of new medicines. So in medicine, you have to demonstrate effectiveness for all groups. And um, you have to do uh, reviews for algorithmic bias on medical algorithms. And uh, Digital Promise has now made a guide for doing algorithmic bias reviews in education as well. Um, improve tools and resources. This is something the learning analytics community of practice needs to do. Some of you folks may go into this field. If you do, we need you. And finally, broaden the community. And it's great to see such a, you know, a diverse collection of people here. I, I always ma makes me really happy to see because as Linda Tuhiwai Smith noted, members of the community being affected by bias can always do a better job of advocating for the perspective than well-meaning outsiders. Well-meaning outsiders often fail to fully understand the issues or the constraints on a successful solution. And this applies everywhere you go, industry, academia, government, the nonprofit sector. And consult community members throughout the development of algorithms, not just at the end for usability. Um, expand efforts to develop tools for broader participation and development, like explainable artificial intelligence. So I hope that some of you, or at least a couple of you, have been inspired by this to maybe think, hey, maybe I should be working on problems like this, because I really believe that we've got some real problems in learning engineering around algorithmic bias. But if we work together, we can make the world better. So let me open the floor to questions in just a second, but let me finish with a commercial. Um, so the Penn Center for Learning Analytics has a Twitter and a Facebook feed where we publish all of our latest scientific findings. We don't spam your uh, your Twitter feed, only, only our results. 
We have, a, again, a free massive online open course on edX, big data and education. <clears throat> you can even find all the videos on my webpage, but the edX MOOC has assignments to teach you how to do uh, um, learning analytics. All of our lab publications are available online. Google Ryan Baker. I'm not the CBS News anchor in Chicago, nor am I the Miami Dolphins linebacker. And um, thank you all for your time and attention. And I would love to discuss with, with folks. Thank you so, oh. Hello, can people hear me? Great, thank you so much, Dr. Baker. Um, I now wanna turn it to all of y'all to ask any questions you may have had during the chat. Um, and also feel free to take some time to think. Anyone have a question? Just raise your hand. Um, oh, great, thank you. Um, could you just say your name and your question? Hi, my name is Angie. Um, my question is sort of leading off of the summary you gave of existing studies. Uh, so I was kind of curious about whether there are any technologies or any predictive factors that you think simply like do not suit AI particularly well. Like, is there anything that you think we've like tried to predict or um, you know, like tried to use technology for that it just a human would do a better job or it just there's no like way to really do it fairly? You know, that's a really great question. And I would say that actually, first of all, human beings are really unfair a lot of the time. Um, so in some ways, trying to do better than a human being is actually not that hard. Y you know, it's funny, all these things that I might have said earlier in my career were really hard to do. People have been able to do since then. It's amazing how AI is moving forward and what it can do. To me, the, the question is more, what should AI be doing and how can we keep humans in the loop? So I, I do think there are some things that human beings don't want computers to do. For example, we've often found that, that technologies can tell which kids are disengaged in class better than teachers can, but teachers don't necessarily feel like they want or need that. Um, I, I think that there are prediction problems that so far we haven't succeeded at, um, but my gosh, it's amazing how the technology marches forward. And I think as it continues to march forward and as people continue to use it, our goal has to be on checking it and always watching where it's failing. Um, <clears throat> I think we can surmount these issues, um, and I think we can actually create technologies that are fairer than people, but, uh, but doing that means we've got to be constantly vigilant. Hi, my name's Veronica, and my question has to do, do you think a lot of the issues stem from the lack of accessibility and understanding data? And what do you recommend we could do to make this data and how data is measured more accessible and more clear for a lot of other people who aren't exposed to this? That's a wonderful question. And I mean, I think we have to be way more transparent to the people who are being affected by our algorithms about every part of our process. We should tell them how we develop our models, uh, wh where we get the data from, um, how we process the data to create examples for the algorithm, um, what our algorithm was. There are things we can do at each of those steps. You know, explainable artificial intelligence is way better than it used to be for some of the fancy modern algorithms. Um, and a lot of times when people are not transparent, it's because they have something to hide. I mean, it's not always the case, but I'll give you an example. A lot of the emotion recognition stuff out there doesn't work very well. And a lot of the reason why a lot of the emotion recognition stuff doesn't work very well is because almost all of it is based, almost all the commercial emotion detection stuff is based on a theory of emotion from the 1970s, which has been discredited for about 30 years. And like you got all these vendors building tech around a discredited theory that nobody in the field really believes anymore. Um, and and a lot of the vendors, uh, they'll, they'll use convenience samples. They'll use the people in the office to build the technology, right? They'll, they'll like collect data on people in the office and then gosh, it doesn't work in the real world. Who would have guessed? Um, so, I mean, I think if we start saying people, you've got to have like a label on this. It's like, you know, on your food, the food's got to say that it's got monosodium glutamate in it and sodium nitrate. Similarly, we got to say this algorithm was built on um, <clears throat> this group of, of learners, and it wasn't built on these people. And here's the algorithm we use, and here's how we tested it. And if we, if we, and here's how it works. And if we don't take those steps, we can take a step. So if we don't, we end up with things that are not understandable by the people using them. 
Did I answer your question or did I go off on a tangent and ramble? I apologize if I did. No, you answered it. I just, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about like what the disconnect is, like how do we make this information, break it down and make it easier for let's say somebody younger than me or somebody who may have a language barrier living in this country, if you have that insight. I mean, I wouldn't say I, ha I know everything about that. It's a really important and hard question. Um, First of all, we have to kind of work with the people who are in the communities that we want to understand it. We can't just, like, if I, as somebody who's worked in this field for 20 years, like, make a description, it might be super clear to me, but that doesn't mean it's clear to anybody else. You actually have to get somebody from the community who's going to be accessing it and get them to sit down and look at it and say, what's hard to understand here? And, um, and work, you know, work with them. Like we have the tools in explainable AI to kind of break down, here's the most important variables for the prediction. And here's how they interact. Or for example, Ryan, you're like, you're the reason why you're gonna drop out of high school is because you keep getting into fist fights. Real problem for me. Um, you know, you've got to like take those bite-sized chunks. So you have to kind of to, to do the work to get the algorithm to spit out why it's making the decision it's making. And then you have to work with the people who are gonna use that to make sure they can understand what the algorithm is telling them. Does that answer better? Yes. Yep. Thank you, yes, I knew does. I was Thank a little. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, so I have like two questions. The first question is, um, so you're suggesting that we should eliminate identifying factors as race and um, gender when we're doing machine learning algorithms. And my second question is, uh, what are some resources that do you think are beneficial in trying to learn like data science and AI and machine learning? Well, those are two great questions. Answer the first one. So we definitely wanna use data on race and gender and identity, <clears throat> but we don't wanna use it as predictors. We wanna use it to check afterwards. So. A model that says, like, let's say we tell a high school teacher, this student is more at risk of dropping out because they're in this race. What are they going to do with that information, right? Like, um, it might reinforce the teacher's own racial biases. That's a bad thing. Um, you certainly can't change the student's race. You can't change their culture based on their race. You, you, um, it's, it's inert information. Even if it turns out it's predictive, it's probably there because of biases in the system not because of things that are legitimately um, actionable. We should be giving, making, making predictions and giving information on them based on things that people can do something about and not reinforcing bias. Uh, but once we've built the algorithms, there are ways to build algorithms to try to make them be less uh, biased. For example, there's a method called cost-sensitive classification, which tries to make sure that the algorithm is equally effective for members of every group while it's building it. So that's a good way to use those kind of variables. We just shouldn't be using it as predictors. And then for learning data science methods, well, if you wanna learn them in education, I'm gonna give my commercial again, my MOOC Big Data in Education is something that over 100,000 people have taken. And many people working in the field now, like thousands have taken it as their starting point in the field. And I would recommend it because you know we've been, we've been trying to improve it for nine years. Um, <clears throat> outside of learning analytics and data mining and education, there's a lot of resources out there. I will confess that I don't know which, for generic machine learning, for generic data science, I don't know which the best ones are out there. Um, I think Chris Brooks at Michigan has a massive online open course, and he's amazing at explaining things, so he might be worth looking for his stuff, but I, I don't entirely know where to tell you where to start just generically. Uh, hi, Ryan. Thank you for this amazing presentation. I was just wondering what you think the role of city, state, and federal governments are in this issue uh, without necessarily like them stifling innovation. That's a wonderful question. Um, <clears throat> let's start with city. If you are in a city and you have a school, you know, you have a city school district, your city school district should only adopt technologies, should either A, if a technology is established and being sold as is, you should only adopt technologies with evidence that it works in your it, for kids like yours. Like, so if you are a district that is say 80% African-American lower income, 
you should only adopt a technology as is if it's got evidence that it works for for schools like that. Now, exception, if you're, you know, if the if a vendor comes to you and says, hey, I want to test if my technology works in contexts like yours, please support that. Because we can only determine if these things work if we actually do the research. But so <clears throat> as a city, you should adopt, you should support the conductance of research to make sure things work for learners like yours and only adopt technology as is if there's such evidence. A part of that also is that cities, y'all are in New York City right now. New York City, unfortunately, has the, it is the least supportive, uh, it is the least supportive municipal in institution for educational research in the entire United States, unfortunately. I, I used to be at Teachers College Columbia University. It literally takes over 10 times as much effort to run a study in New York City than any other city in the United States that I'm aware of. New York City just has all these regulations that are really badly written and really bureaucratic. Um, that doesn't actually protect New York City's students. Um, it, it means that technologies don't work as well for them. That is not, and you can actually, silly, silly enough, a teacher can just go and deploy any technology in New York City just tomorrow. No problem. No one's going to stop them from it. But you can't test if a technology works in New York City. And so as a result, nobody does. Um, so that's what. So that's a big problem. Cities have to set up uh, things that make it possible to do the work. As a state, as a state, a lot of states can say which curriculums are approved and which curriculums aren't approved, and they can set in motion good processes for testing for that. Um, if you are looking at the state level in terms of your state's legislation, um, you know, people who are involved in politics or involved in public service can write better or worse laws around um, privacy and ed tech and make it so that the laws genuinely protect, pri protect privacy while not preventing people from looking at algorithmic bias. At the federal level, there's even more one can do because there's crafting good legislation, there's crafting good standards, pushing for things like uh, the What Works Clearinghouse, um, which is like a national clearinghouse of what technologies work, to start paying attention to context. Um, that the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Education, supporting the funding of, of research onto these topics. Actually, National Science Foundation and IES, Institute of Education Sciences and Department of Education, have been very supportive of this kind of stuff. And they've been really starting to pay attention. Um, so I actually think the federal government has been doing a lot of good in these areas. Uh, the only real concern I have at the federal level, to be honest, is that someday the Senate is going to pass a student privacy law that permanently ends any attempt to fix algorithmic bias in the United States. Um, for example, there's a Senator Markey and Senator Hawley on the left and on the right working are working together to try to make it so that we can never, ever again fix algorithmic bias for K-12 in the U.S. I don't even know if they know what they're doing with the, the laws they're, they keep trying to pass, but it would permanently make it would permanently set algorithmic bias in place make it impossible ever to fix in K-12. All right, our last question. Hey Ryan, <laughs> um, just wondering what signals would you use as predictors outside of like say grades, because this is an iterative process, right? And so you're gonna keep building the model, testing accuracy, and <clears throat> even things like, like name or uh, residence address would introduce some sort of bias, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be using residence address because that gets so tied into uh, demographic factors, uh, poverty, um, segregation. Um, I actually think that the way to go with data is the opposite way. And I kind of didn't really talk about what kind of predictors we use today. But, you know, digital learning platforms, games, simulations, homework platforms, there's so much rich interaction between students and the platforms. You know, when a student pauses is informative. What they do after they ask for help is informative. If they talk to another student, which student they talk to is informative and what they talk to them about. I would be going finer grain. The more we can go into the finer grained aspects of learning that, that are already happening in a digital way that we can already capture, the more we can do there. I actually am a big believer that the more, that the more we go towards that fine grain stuff and the more we go away from very coarse grain stuff, the better we will do. So I heard that was the last question, but I wanna encourage everybody here you know, I'm not in New York today. I apologize. I couldn't make it. But please Google me, uh, Ryan Baker. Uh, send me an email. I'm glad to chat about it.
If any of y'all are interested in opportunities in this field, let me know. I'd be happy to kind of help make connections or give suggestions. Love to bring bright young minds like y'all into our field. So thank you all for being here today.